Thanks very much, Keith. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm all good, mate. All good. Great, great to have you on. It's been a while anyway. I've been trying to sort this out <laughs> for a while with David himself, you know. I know, I know, I know. Happy to be on, mate. Happy to be on. Now, you've re- retired officially, isn't that right? Officially retired, mate. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the life has changed, but still enjoying it, you know. Yeah, and you were with Luke and Lass, is that right? Are you yeah, well, doing a bit of work there? I'm still there, yeah. So um, obviously, at the minute, I'm like doing the doing my coaching badges and stuff. So um, I'm going to start the way for a license soon. So I'm um, kind of helping out with the first team, like coaching and uh, helping John with the team and Alan with the team and stuff there. And then um, some nights I coach uh, some of the younger teams. So I do two girls teams and two boys teams. But obviously the the schoolboy leagues have taken a bit of a backseat at the minute, Keith, you know yourself with um, the COVID-19 issues and stuff. So um, I'm not sure what the actual process is for them on returning. But um, from our point of view, from the first team point of view, we are um, back up and running. We started back last Tuesday. So the lads have done Tuesday, Thursday, and then tomorrow it'll be Tuesday, Thursday, Sundays from now until the start of the season, which I believe is going to be kind of the back end of July. I think there was an announcement the other day. I think it starts the, either the Friday, the 17th, or Sunday, the 19th, depending on when your team plays or who you draw, you know. And you just mentioned the coaching badges there. Is that something you'd want to get into in the future? Would you like to basically coach in maybe the League of Ireland or maybe even in England? I know you've kids as well, don't you? So maybe yeah. England wouldn't be an option right now. No, I don't see myself going back away, Keith. Like, um... Obviously, the decision to come home, like, after so many years over there, like, our eldest girl is, is 11 in two weeks. So, um, you know, I'm kind of, we came home with the kind of mindset in, like, we're coming home. Like, you know what I mean? We're not going to come home and then move back away. So, from an England point of view, um, I don't think so. Obviously, you can never say never, but um, as it stands now, um, League of Ireland, um I don't know, it's it's possibility. Like I wouldn't like the real out now, but for me at the minute, like I'm really happy um with how we're going at Luke and we've got some really good lads and we've tried to make it as kind of professional as possible. You know, so training's all structured, everybody knows what they're doing when they get there and you know, from that point of view we're trying to implement a few new things in terms of equipment and stuff, trying to add to the infrastructure that we have. So um, it's all systems. Got, everything's going in the right direction in, in terms of that uh, part of the coaching. So um, everybody seems to be enjoying it. And, you know, that's the most important thing. I just, not that you want to give back because that's a bit corny, but like I want to do well. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't like kind of like to go into a club where we were struggling. And, you know, obviously when you're winning and doing well, it makes everything a bit easier. So from that point of view, everything's going well. Would you prefer to coach kids or adults? Oh, for me, adults. For me, adults. Um, yeah, because with the kids, like you got kind of got to watch everything you say and your structure and sessions, and it's a bit of a slower pace. Where with adults, you can get stuck right into them. You know, I just think from the background that I've had, like just driving people on, like with your voice and stuff, can make a big difference. So. Obviously, with kids, you can't really do that. The, the higher you go up in ages, yeah, you can force a little bit more out of them, but, you know, everything has to be a bit more slow and deliberate and, you know, kind of, you actually have to get to the point, structure what you're going to say, where with the lads that we have at the minute, like, anything kind of goes and, you know, you're not afraid to give them a good kick up the arse if they're, um, if they're not doing what they're asked, you know? You started your youth career at Lucan, didn't you, yourself? Like, so. No, no, my, my, youth, career, my youth career was, um, I started with Bushy Park Rangers in Terran Europe. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, and I played there up until probably about 13, I think, or 14, and then I went to Rovers from there, and then I progressed through at Rovers. Now, Lucan, do, we do have, um, not like an amalgamation, but we do have, like, um, you know, 
probably a, yeah a bit of a link there with rovers and um, so when they do like summer camps they'll do it you know they'll do one for lucan's um underage teams so that all the players that are associated with lucan can kind of um get the knowledge and experience of the coaches um from shamrock rovers which is really good and you can kind of if you're good and you're at a certain level you know they're not afraid to um you know give you a trial i think we had a few lads go up to the 17s and to the 19s on trial and stuff so it's good from that point of view you can kind of see a progression if you're doing well so um it's a good one to have in the club that where you know if you come and you do well and you know the rovers managers at 19s and 17s level take a take a liking to you if they come out and watch a game or they hear about you because you know what it's like if if i say if I rang Desi Baker or, you know, Thomas Morgan or Tony Cousins or whoever's involved there in the youth set up at Shamrock Rovers and I give some kid a recommendation, they're going to, like, probably have a look at them anyway. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So, um, from that point of view, it is good. But we obviously want to try and keep, especially most of the good ones, unless someone's going to actually go and make a career, we want to try and keep the good ones for ourselves because we want to try and get to the top lens, the senior league, and then, you know, see where we can go with, could be the new cabin Teeley or whatever, you know, if someone can can pump a few quid in. But um from our point of view now, at the start, like it's going really well. And hopefully now with the season reopening we can finish off the last eight games and, and try and get promoted. Yeah, do you feel yeah, yourself be. Yeah, do you feel yourself you're personally involved in some of the rugby club as such as well? Sorry, man, I thought you kind of broke well, up Yeah, there. it went to be funny there. Are you kind of involved within the running structures of the club also, not just the coaching side, or is that something you yeah. like to get into as well? No, look, I do have a little bit of input, like, but no, John and Keith, they're, Keith's the chairman, John, the owner, they, or John's the, the manager of the first team, but he kind of oversees the whole club. Um, they, would, they would basically, like, kind of run the whole thing, but... Like, they always ring me for, you know, this, this and this or, you know, to ask me advice on what they think we should do, or even in terms of, like, the equipment and, and just trying to get better infrastructure in the club because I think it's important that when when people come, if you've got good equipment, I know it sounds silly, but if you've got, like, bibs that don't smell and aren't ripped, like, it just makes a little bit of a difference. Like, you know, people feel appreciating better players. Now, you know, at the minute we're there and obviously people are having to take their own bibs home if they wear a bib in training they have to take that home you know john's up he cleans all the balls you know he cleans the goal post like we we have he works for pfizer so we've obviously got um the best of the best equipment in terms of trying to prevent any uh, bacterial spread um from from the infection if i don't know if there was any chance of us getting it but you know from that point of view we're doing things right as well so it's it's encouraging to see, and um, you know, f- from from the first team's point of view, you know, the effort that they've put in last Tuesday and Thursday was phenomenal, and hopefully we can keep that going and and kind of stay fit because I think it's so important that in any football environment, like that, you're fit, able to get get on second balls and able to counter attack teams, you know, with a bit of pace and a bit of energy. So it doesn't matter what level you play at, but it's important. It's so it's so important to be fit and. That's one thing we're trying to instill in the lads. Yeah, going back to Shamrock Rovers there, they were your first club in the League of Ireland, weren't they? Um, where were they playing at the time? Was it Tolkien Park? Oh, jeez, we played everywhere. Or were we they played everywhere at the time, yeah. yeah. I think we played, we played in Tolkien, we played in... Yeah. I think we might have played in... Did Aidy Mount? No, Richmond? Exactly. No, I think we played in Aidy Mount for a while, actually, as well, under Roddy. Yeah, we kind of we were we went the, we went around the we went around the grounds, but um, for me, I'm like a Shamrock Rovers fan. I live kind of probably I don't know a kilometer away from the ground. So, well, I used to live a kilometer away from the ground. I don't live there anymore. But um, my mum and dad still do. But yeah, that was my first club, and obviously to come through the skill boys at skill boy level, like we won the All Ireland, and you know we had a really good team. I think two or three of us progressed on to the first team and stuff. So. That was obviously a great moment when you get to make your debut and I played I think I played in the first team for about eighteen months or in and around that and then um obviously I left and went to Longford. But yeah, Shamrock Rovers, I was there for I think six or seven years. So, you know, it was obviously 
a massive massive uh, factor in my in my career and one that you know when I look back I'm very proud to have played for you know Shamrock Rovers and obviously progress through the skill boys when you see like the setup they have now at skill boy level it's phenomenal so um to be a part of that at the very start when we used to train in like Kiltipper and not have much now home ground and then you look at them now and you've got the roads down with the all-weather pitch and the best facilities in Ireland probably and you know the stadium's a dream probably a dream to play in you know the only time we ever went to the stadium was for the team photo and behind us was just like an empty stand you know the, you know the main stand there now like there wasn't even a seat in the actually I think there might have been two seats or something in it but that was it so you know, you look at it now on a packed European night or when they played Drotted or Dundalk there a few weeks ago or a few months ago now, like it's great to see, isn't it? You know, eight thousand people at a League of Ireland game, that's what that's what we want to see. And to give us the spectacle they did, you know, was from both teams, you know, we've seen probably the goal of the season already in that game. And, you know, I just think the league is is really progressing, especially from them two teams. Hopefully the rest can try and, you know, yeah just inject a little bit more and catch up a little bit because them two teams are obviously at the ministry to head. It must have been a dream for you to actually play for Rovers, but I'd say there's a part of you thinking, I wish I played, I was playing at the time when Tala Stadium was open, to think it was yeah, open or something I, like that, wasn't it? So you just I missed out by a couple of years, didn't you really, in reality, but um, I just feel with Rovers, they kind of lacked an identity for a while because we're moving around everywhere and they probably lost that thing that they had, didn't they, because of that. And it's just so important for any team to actually have their own stadium, never mind a brilliant stadium like Tallis Stadium in itself, you know? Yeah, like, I actually don't even think, I've never even played a game there, would you believe? Like, even when I left and went to Longford and went to Cork, <laughs> like, I think I think they moved in maybe the year or two after. Um, yeah. So it's yeah. probably about, I don't know even how long it's it's been open. But I left 2010, in 2010, it opened, yeah. 2010, so two years after I left, they moved in. So um, it's funny, but like I've gone up, I've gone up a good few times, especially now that I've been back. And actually, um, I actually went training with them last year, just for, when I was home at Easter for the week, and you know it was really enjoyable. I know Stephen Bradley, we used to play schoolboy against each other, so I still kind of talk to him and pick his brains for like certain sessions and stuff that we can do at Air Club and. You know, speak to Jack Bourne and a couple of the lads, Greg Bulger and stuff there. So, you know, they're a really good team and I just hope and I pray that they can win the league this year. I think they did. they deserve, if any team deserves to knock Dundalk off their perch, I think it's Rovers, like, because everything they've invested in, the way they do things, the way they play the game, like the tree at the back or whatever way they play um, on any given night, like, I just think they, they really express themselves with that little box formation they play in midfield. So, um, I think they're going to take some stopping this year and fingers crossed that the lads can keep on producing and scoring the goals that will win them the league. You obviously watch games then. Have you noticed much of a difference in quality compared to the time you played in the league itself? What kind of things have changed? Are the fitness levels higher, would you suggest? Or uh, what's think, different, I do you think? I think at the time when I was leaving, I think was probably the league was maybe at its strongest. We obviously had a lot of investment then, like we had, we probably had five or six teams who were really good, you know, um, Drotta, they were p- pumping in money, um, at Cork, we were, they were pumping in money, you know, Bowes were always good, they were pumping in money, you know, Shells, all them type of teams were around, Rovers were around, like, but I think now, like, the difference probably now is them two teams are so far ahead that... I think on certain nights, like you're turning up at a game and you're expecting Rovers to win, you know. Yeah. You look at, you look at, you could be at a Rovers game and you'll check the scores at half time and then Dark will be winning. You know, I just, I think it's, I think it'd be more beneficial if the likes of Derry can like properly get back up and running and, you know, Shells get back up and running. I know they've started off really well and, you know, if teams like that can really get going, where it'd be like five or six teams running for the Pats even, you know, under Stevie, and mm. I just think it would be so more beneficial. You get bigger crowds and stuff, like where sometimes people might see, I don't know, Rovers playing UCD, ah, shit, they're going to romp that game, we won't turn up. And that's that's like the mentality in Ireland, where in England, it doesn't matter who you're playing, 
whether you're top of the league by 30 points and you're playing the bottom team, that bottom team, you know, might turn you over, where over here, it rarely happens, like, especially, you can see it this year, like, the, I think the four games between the two teams, like, are probably going to decide it, you know, to be honest, and obviously I know with Bows and Rovers, them games can go either way, so Dundalk are probably hoping, like, Rovers might drop a few points against Bows and stuff, but I think the big games are going to be the last, the next three between um, the big two in terms of deciding, you know, where in what direction like that league is going to go. But, you know, I think the benefits that Rovers certainly have is they have a young squad that are very fit. They all get around the pitch. But the one thing I noticed about Stephen is he works a lot on like the team and the team shape, but incorporates everybody into it. So, if he makes a change in the game, when someone's coming on, they know what their role is. You know, where sometimes you see someone come on and they mightn't play up to the same level as the other play- players. But, you know, you look at the bench now, like even Dylan Watts, when he comes on, like he's an excellent player and stuff. So they've got a really good squad, a lot of good young lads coming through as well. So I think the future is certainly bright for Rovers and hopefully they can hold on to Jack Bourne and Graham Burke and, you know, all the lads like that. 100%. It's only good for the league if we keep them players, you know. Uh, you yeah. move on to Longford then, and you had a good time at Longford, in fairness. You had a couple of seasons yeah. there. But you had a strange yeah. one because you were top scorer in the league. Uh, I think it was 2007. Would that be right? You had 19 yeah. league goals, and the yeah. team got relegated. <laughs> yeah, I think we got deducted points, though, Keith, to be honest. Was it that it. season you got deducted yeah. points? Yeah, yeah. Ah. so we, ah. we obviously we hit a bit of financial... Um, Trouble, but the year before we, the year before that we done well, and I think I got fourteen the year before or something, something like that. But it was just starting to click into gear for me, and and um, we got Trevor Crawley in as a coach, and I all like make reference to Trevor, like even when I look at Bowles now and some of the stuff he does with some of the younger lads, like you look at um, Mandrew there, like he's an excellent player at Bowles, but. Um, when he came in, he gave us, obviously Alan was very, very good in terms of his management style and he knew he was very methodical in how he wanted to play. But Trevor came in and just added a bit of sprinkle on top of the cake, you know, and like he worked very hard with us. Like when I worked in Irish Rail, I used to, we used to go training and then we train in Westmanstown and he, um, he used to come up about... So I'd finish at about four, I think, in the in Irish Rail, and we'd we'd head up there for five. Myself, myself, Shay Kelly, Desi Baker would turn up as well, and we'd have a spot of lunch or like kind of you know, not a dinner, but we'd have like a bit something to eat there in Westminstertown, and then we'd head out into the training pitch kind of before people start to turn up, and we'd work on like little movements and finishes and finishing from different angles and different types of finishes and stuff with a keeper and goal as well. So that helped because then it becomes instinctive. You're like, when you get into that position in a game, you know kind of what you're going to do. Um, but that was one thing that I always, you know, I always revert back to when I'm uh, doing interviews. Like, you can, the people that have helped me get to kind of the career I had, you kind of never forget them, you know. And Trevor was a big influence. Obviously, Alan was a massive influence. But I think Trevor, like, kind of developed my game um, in a really positive way. Um, over he, seems to a, he seems to be a bit of a coach, coach if you understand what I mean. Because a lot yeah. of people say that um, his coaching abilities is top notch. I've never heard anyone say anything else. Yeah, and no, I was frightened, frightened coach. And I think him and Keith Long are working well at Paul's. But again, like you look back at the financial um, probably restraints that they have, like in terms of attracting players, they're always going to play, you know, second and third fiddle. Like, if there's a player available in the league and you know, Dundalk and Rovers are, are going after them, Bowes or Pats or Derry are very rarely going to get them. Do you know what I mean? Because you're, you're going to go to one of the top two. So, um, yeah, it's it's probably difficult for them. But the one thing they do do is he's de- he develops players really well. And I think him and Keith Long are doing a super job. And... Even as a Rovers fan, like it'd be good to see Bowers challenging, like as much as that pains me to say, but it would, like, because that's what the league needs. You know, as I said to you earlier on, it needs five or six teams who are, you know, really going, you know, pedal to the metal, chasing each other. You know, when they all play each other, big atmosphere, big games, like, and 
and that's what you want to see. You don't just want to see Dundalk Rovers and Bowes Rovers like as the big games. You want to see like you know Bowes Derry or Bow, you know. So you want to generate that. Outside Dublin as well, if possible. Yeah, Waterford, Cork, even back in the day when I played for Cork, or even when I was at Longford, like we had a used to have a great little turnout. You know, even the year we went down. Because we were fighting for our lives and the club was obviously in financial difficulty and we got deducted points, there was a big rally in the city, you know, and we got to the cup final and obviously Cork beat us 1-0, but, like, we had a great year that year, you know, I think, um, obviously, from a personal level, it was a great year winning the player of the year in the league and kind of all that stuff, but I think, you know, from the point of view of a collective, like, it, even though we went down, I think we all held our held uh, held our heads high, and you know we could be proud of what we achieved. Because if we hadn't been deducted the points, we would have stayed up. Mm, yeah, it's a pity that way. Now you moved on to Cork, obviously, and you did not real goal record at Cork. I think you yeah. hold the record for the most consecutive goals scored in games. I think you scored fourteen goals in nine games. Is that right? Uh, I think it might be something like that. I can't. Like that. I have to I have to check back on it, but yeah. Yeah, I'm pretty I, sure, but uh, that's some record. I had, a, I, had some time, yeah. I had a great time there, but obviously that was a phenomenal team. Like you know, um, George O'Callaghan, Joe Gamble, Colin Healy. Did you sign the same day as George O'Callaghan? Um, I think we might have been in and around the same time. I'm not sure yeah. if it's the same day, but um, obviously George is a larger than life character. You know, an absolute madman, but. You know, the other lads that were there were, like, phenomenal, phenomenal players, like, and ones that you kind of, you develop your professionalism. So I found that when I was going along, like, at Rovers, when I started out, it was like, they were great lads. We used to have a great laugh and a joke and blah, blah, blah. Then I moved to Longford, similar, but, like, Alan instilled a bit more, like, when we're working, we're working. And then I went to Cork, and it was like, these lads were creating the vibe in the changing room. Do you know what I mean? So you look at Colin Healy, if you weren't on it, he'd be telling you, like, come on, up your game, hold it up, get in the box, score a goal, like, or whatever. If you're a winger and you weren't crossing it, get get wide, cross the ball, defenders, like, defend. So I think from that point of view, in terms of growing up and learning about, you know, how to kind of, uh, kind of assert yourself on the team, that was, like, a big influence as well on me and, you know, the, the time that I had down there was, like, the best ever. Like, you know what I mean? In terms of what we achieved in them, I think I played 26 games for Cork, but I don't remember, like, a bad one, really, you know? 29 and 20 goals, apparently, and you scored 15 goals in the league. I think you were top scorer again, weren't you, that season? Yeah, I think I finished top scorer uh, again, but obviously I left um, yeah. in August. I left in the August, but, yeah, yeah I did finish top scorer. Yeah. Um, then they went on to win they went on to win the cup and the satanta cup and and stuff and it's just you know them kind of memories i kind of was saying to alan like when when the club was like i think the owner at the time he had the two it was the 2008 crash wasn't he and he owned a lot of property around in the uk and it all went belly up and then it was like they had to they needed the money so Alan was like, you kind of, you know, and I was like, can I not just stay and then go in the kind of January, you know, but he was like, no, you have to go, you have to go. So when you look back, it's kind of like a bit disappointing that you had to leave. But obviously, you know, you can understand from from the club's point of view, from a financial point of view, and even from my own financial point of view, it was more beneficial for me to leave at the time. But it was a bit like painstaking to leave and then to see them like win the cups and stuff because I went through my career like at senior football and I never kind of won it. And so when you look back, you think like I could have had like two medals there would have been, but you know it is what it is, and that's how it goes. You've just kind of highlighted a lot of the issues that are in the Irish game there, really though, haven't you? I mean, you're part of a club and tomorrow you could be gone, like because of no choice of your own and of no yeah. fault of the club necessarily. But it's so delicate. You even look at what Cork what's happened to Cork in the last couple of years from where they were and you know they've you know they nearly went bust at one point. They're a shadow of themselves at the minute, you know, I just I don't know how they're gonna fare it out. Like I think they're gonna be fighting a relegation battle, aren't they, this year really? You know, you can't really you can't see them pushing Dundalk and Rovers. The only two teams I think that can kind of hold on to players in terms of financial um would be Dundalk and Rovers like 
then obviously Jack Bourne might go, but some team's going to have to pay mad money. Like Because I don't think Rovers are in a position where they need to kind of overly sell. Probably on a probably on a couple of year deal left, so you know it's going to be up to Jack and the people who look after him to maybe negotiate with the club in terms of how he may live. But because obviously for him, you know it'd be sad to see him go. It'd be sad for me to watch going to watch Rovers and not seeing him play because he's a joy to watch. But from his own, like he has to for his career. Even I feel I feel like I feel like so. Yeah, I feel like eventually he will have to kind of if he wants to sustain that you know, Ireland level and probably prosper in terms of the championship or in the Premier League or even abroad, like he probably will have to one day leave. Hopefully hopefully not this season and we he can bring Rovers to um to the title but It'd be a good way to leave. I think I think like he probably will like probably have to leave in the next year anyway. Yeah, I think it's vital for someone like this Jack. If he does go back, Jack go back. <laughs> it's yeah. to find the club that really suits his football as well because I'm not going to say he's a niche player, but there's a lot of clubs in England that play a style of football that could just not suit him at all, isn't there, in fairness? Like, there's a lot of teams that play kind of, I won't say long ball football, but it's kick and run style football. Yeah. And you're taking a Jack Byrne out of the equation a little bit there, so it's vital when he does go back that he that the side that he goes to really, really suit his style. I think with Jack, like when you watch him play, like he pops up and he'll pick the ball up at centre half. You know, and then he'd pick it up on the left wing, he'd pick it up on the right. He's kind of everywhere, where in England they kind of want a bit more structure in terms of, you know, patterns of play and you're in his space, don't be coming into his space, where Rovers kind of create space for Jack maybe to prosper. So, you know, but I think that's credit to the manager as well. You know, he knows he's got a phenomenal player, probably the best player in the league. Um, how are we going to get the best out of him? You know, other players need to make space for Jack to then, you know, come in and prosper. And then also having the foil of Graham Burke as well, who's a who's a big goal threat. And, you know, the lads up front, I know um, Gaffney, who they've brought back, is an excellent player. Obviously, Aaron Green will run all day for, for you, and he stretches the pitch great, which is, which then creates even more space for Jack to get on the ball and play. So I think when you look at how Rovers play, they are set up, you know, for their better players to be even better and more influential on the game. So, you know, you can only give credit to, you know, the two Stevens and Glenn Cronin there. So I think, like, from, from that point of view, they are probably, you know, way ahead of maybe others in terms of how they play and how they see the game. 100%. Now, you moved, you obviously talked about there, but you moved to Reading. How did that come about in terms of, did you have other offers? Or? Yeah, I had I had a few offers, but I think Reading were kind of, they were on they were on the day, like, you know, so it was like kind of, you know, Cork need the money, we're willing to pay, you know, and I, my, the agent at the time was like getting deals from other clubs, but the other clubs weren't coming up with the money and you know, probably in hindsight, maybe it wasn't the best club for me to go to in terms of m- my personal development and stuff. But, you know, obviously that goes out the window. You think you're making the right decision at the time. But when you look back, you can always pick holes in every decision that you've ever made. So, listen, it was I had a great time. I made some great friends at Reading. I never really played a game. I think I played four games or something. But, you know... In terms of that, like three-year period, financially, you know, even like, even like, you know, ego was to play for Reading. It was, it was great, or to be classed as a Reading player was great because they were a really good club at the time. So, I, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed training every day. Like it was amazing playing with some of them players that I played with, and you know, seeing how they done things and learning off the coaches and stuff and even then taking down some sessions and session notes for what you might then do yourself in the future like we had brendan rogers there for i think he was in for six months and then he got the sack but like that six months was phenomenal you know his sessions and his attention to detail were phenomenal mm. well, were there any irish players there at the time i'm trying to think back at the uh, time or Do- doyle and long there Doyle, Long, the two Hunts. There at the time. Yeah, yeah. Oh, just very few Irish at the time then, yeah. Uh, yeah. Alex Pierce. Yeah. Um, trying to think who else there was. Scott Davis. Would you class, would you class him as Irish? But he was, he was there. He played, for <laughs> he played for Ireland 21s at the time. He's a great yeah, lad. Yeah. Um, 
I think that was it. And then we had a few on the U team and stuff. But yeah, it was a good it was a good crop of us. Like we all got on great and had had the laugh. But you know, you're going into a team where they're all established and you're trying to make a name for yourself, even though you've come with a great reputation. It's always in the manager's mind to stick with what he knows. You know that type of way, no matter who you are or what you kind of do in training. And I think Kevin was supposed to leave and I was maybe coming in then to challenge the others, but Kevin ended up staying and you know, all these things happen and you're going to kind of go a year and, you know, you're not really playing and you find yourself like kind of getting into a bit of a rut, you know, where you think it's not going to happen for you and stuff. So um, it was difficult in terms of mentally difficult, but in terms of all the other things, it was great, great time. Yeah, it's difficult for a striker, I think. If you're not getting in, I think with a striker, you really need to run a game as a striker, don't you? Mm-hmm. And as you say, yeah. if you have strikers, a set of strikers that are doing well, how can you drop them? That's the other side of it as well. Yeah. And it leaves you in a vicious cycle, doesn't it? It does. It's massive. But I think also, even if you have a striker who the manager knows has done well before from previously, and he's maybe going through a bit of a run, he'll always kind of stick with him, you know? He'll come out of it, he'll come out of it. Like, and you can't go in and be like, well, why is Kevin Doyle playing? Because he's amazing. That's why he's playing, you know what I mean? So... You can't ever challenge, you know, a manager on a personal level like that. You just got to say, like, what more can I do to play? Like, what what can I do better? And you know, you just try, keep going, keep going. Eventually, your chance will come. But you know, I think at that time at Reading, we had some really amazing players, and you know, to even even train with them was great. If you were a youngster now, or giving advice to a youngster moving over to England, um. What would be your advice? Would you say go to the lower leagues to start off with? Or... No. I know it's, always, difficult. Always, it's a difficult one, isn't it, though? Difficult one. I'd always try and aim as high as I could because then you can fall back. Yeah, because then you can fall back where if you go lower and it doesn't work out for you, you're kind of back to square one. So um, I would always aim for the stars and see where I land. But um, I always get asked this question like in terms of what age... Is it like a pro? Like, what age do you think? Like, because I was obviously 22 when I went, or would you go at 16? It's a difficult one. Do you know what I mean? Obviously, if you're good enough at 16 to be taken away, it's hard to turn it down. Um, I enjoyed playing in the league. I think the league kind of gives you good ground. And um, the summer nights, you know, you play on good pitches over here. You know, you get a bit of exposure in terms of the press because there's kind of it's only the it's only the GAA Championship and the and the Eritrea League that are on at the time. So there is a bit of newspaper coverage. If you're on a good spell, they can kind of blow you up a little bit, makes other teams look. I would I would encourage people to play like in terms of skill boy football. If you're good enough to kind of get in at 17s or 19s at Rovers or Bowls or Pats or whatever. Cork or Drottede, Dundalk, Derry, I would encourage people to go and do that, you know, and then try and make your way into the league and then push on because the league has had some really, really great success stories, you know, um, over the past few years and I think there could be a few more coming, like even the goalie that was at Rovers, Gavin, um, yeah, like he's going to be sensational, where he, like whether he gets into City or not is anybody's guess, but He's certainly not going to fall too far out of that level. So, um, you know, he's gone that route where he got in, even though he was a young lad, 16, 17, Stephen threw him in goal. Like, and that's one position where you think experience counts. Stephen threw him in, he's at City now. He could end up like easily playing 500 games in England. Do you know what I mean? So I would encourage people, like, if, if you feel like you want to do your leave insert and you don't want to go away, to certainly play in the league and then you will always 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 have a chance of going away because they're always looking teams are always looking over here they've nothing else to do in the summer so they're always keeping an eye on the league here so i just think and like you say if you're definitely. good enough as well you're, you're going to get into a rovers or a pats first team or cork or whatever it is and then your opportunity will come in england if you're not good enough to eventually get into one of those teams, it's unlikely you're going to be good enough to make it over in England, let's be honest. So Exactly. And I think now, like, when you look at the league, like, you've got Vinnie Perth at Dundalk, right? Young manager, played in the league, knows the league. You've got Stephen Bradley, young manager, played in the league, knows the league, knows England as well. You know, Steve McDonald at 
uh, paths. Like I think, like when you look at in terms of like where the league is going, young managers, good coaches, you know, developing players, developing young players. Like even all the squads. Like I don't really think there's many people playing from when I played. Do you know what I mean? No, no, no. I think like Ronan Finn I remember playing against Ronan Finn when he was at UCD I can't really remember many more like playing like you know and that's mad very, like that's me it's a very young league at the it is young, it's a young league and it's yeah. it's a very energetic league and I think that's going to all bode well for like you know the league hopefully the FAI can get their act together and you know maybe get behind it a bit more and like G it up a bit and you know, maybe could we give out a few more free tickets to schools or whatever, like to just get, you know, bums on seats is what matters at the end of the day. Or, you know, if I bring my two kids, could I just pay for the adult or whatever, whatever way you want to look at it. Like there's got to be, there's got to be ways and means of, of achieving bigger crowds and getting bigger revenue in the gate and then trying to develop and pay people more and actually give people a livelihood out of it. Because people are thinking now, if I go to Bowes and they give me, 400 euro a week like for the next 10 years like number one you can't get a mortgage no bank's gonna give you a mortgage if you're a footballer in ireland because it's unsustainable so that's one negative straight away if you had a normal job in tesco you'd probably earn 450 a week or 500 a week and you could be there for 40 years and end up being a manager so like you know there's i don't know there's like loads of different ways of looking at stuff but i just think a little bit of cash injection from people like everybody get behind to be able to get a mortgage through football and you know give people a bit of a help and like really encourage them to develop and and stay in the league like the only way the league is going to develop is if you can keep hold of a jack Bourne. well how are you going to keep hold of them you got to give them like silly money that probably four players are getting you know it's so. only one or two clubs that can do that anyway as you say so yeah. What do you do there? Like, you know, but as well as that, like, in terms of getting fans in, I always think a lot of people talk about getting fans in from, say, guys who support Liverpool or Manchester United or whatever. But there's actually a, a bit of a market there where there's fans who actually do like the League of Ireland but don't really go to games. They kind yeah. of look at the League of Ireland, if you know what I mean, from the yeah. outside. It's them guys, I think, you have to. Yeah. to go to games more so than the ones that are maybe ignorant to it all like you know I know I just think that like it's hard like I'm not in marketing or in any of that like so I wouldn't really know but I just think like surely to God like all them heads that are in the FAI or that are you know in the league or even in the PFAI or whatever it is or in the boardrooms at the clubs like how can we how can we generate more like how can we generate more? Like, if the league starts back in a few weeks and the Premier League is still on on a Friday night and Liverpool are playing Man United, say, you're going to have, like, 500 at games, you know? People are going to want to watch Liverpool, Man United rather than maybe going to, I don't know, Rovers, UCD or drop it against Dundalk or Derry against Sligo. Like, it's kind of sad in a way. And I'm probably one of them, like, but... I don't know, like, how can we, as a nation, like, encourage people to get back into football, like... It's a case of, as well, trying to get people out of the house, as well. That's nearly one thing about it, as well, to actually bother to go to a game, and, yeah. you know what I mean, rather... Because, I don't know, live football, I'd rather, honestly, I'd rather go to a, a match between Cork City and Shelburne, let's say, and actually see the game than sit at home and watch Manchester United and Liverpool. But that's just me, you know what I mean? Yeah, I like yeah. the live football aspect and you can see things and it's oh, the smell it's, of the grass. Yeah, everything like that. Yeah. There's nothing better than being at a game. So I look at my own dad, he goes every weekend he's out watching the Leinster Senior League. Like you go and watch three games. Do you know what I mean? My next door neighbour the same. They're up at Newtown Rangers or they're over at Cherry Orchard or down at Crumlin or at Air Game or at Blue Bell like no, and even if you could turn some of the Leinster Senior League heads into like Irish football fans in terms of going to watch the League of Ireland, and I don't know, I don't really know. Like, I don't really know. It'd be just great to see more people in there and for the teams to have like a bigger revenue. Maybe we need more teams as well, or maybe we should have an, in an integrated league between the North and South, or 
yeah. there's got to be something that we can do, like where Linfield coming to drop to Dundalk or Linfield coming to even drop it. It's got to be sold out, you know what I mean? Glenn Torrin coming to Rovers or, you know, Port of Down going to Cork. Like, they're going to be bigger crowds. And could we, like, in some way, like, join the two top leagues of the two Irish divisions together and then the two bottom leagues together and kind of have 40 teams rather than kind of 20 teams? You know, and then that way you're going to see kind of more. You might see five teams who are battling it out for the league. Now, don't get me wrong, I still think Rovers and Dundalk are probably streets ahead of them up the north. But yeah. they, they might up their game a bit more in terms of maybe they might have a few more quid or whatever, I don't know. But, you know, they could then attract, maybe they might be able to attract players from the league instead of it always being Dundalk and Rovers. Maybe Linfield might go, well, we'll give you that, but it's Sterling. And you're like, ooh. You know, but I still think that people are going to need a help from other financial um, parties because to go full-time professional in Ireland now, it is a bit of a risk, like. Big risk, big risk. Well, as you say as well, I think the island of Ireland is far too small to have to do separate leagues, if I'm honest with you. I mean, people yeah. talk about the negatives and this and that and the other, but I, I think it's, it's just simply too small of a country to have two separate leagues, like two separate leagues that generally have struggled. I would say the standard in the League of Ireland has been stronger because it's a bit more professional, probably. But as you say, if a lot of those clubs from the north joined as such, eventually, over time, they would probably become more professional, etc. Well, like people say that, but yet the rugby, the rugby is... You know, you've got Ulster, Leinster, Connacht, Munster, and they're in this, they're in this. What, what is it? The Guinness Fourteen League or whatever, and they play against Scottish teams and Welsh teams, and you know, from from that point of view, like it can work. You know, even Ulster playing Leinster and Ulster playing Munster, like that's all. That's people hiding behind making a decision. From my point of view, the rugby were brave enough and strong enough to go. It's an All Ireland, whatever. Your Ulster, your Munster, your Connacht, and your Leinster, and they're the four provinces, and you are going to play under the Ireland banner when it's an international game. End of story. Where okay, fair enough. Like you might have the Northern Ireland football team and the Republic of Ireland football team, but the Northern Ireland football team pick a lot of players out of Northern Ireland League. So even for them as a country to have, it would benefit. Of course, it would if it was a full time professional environment. Now, I don't know whether, I don't know, I don't know whether I'm going back to a winter league and maybe three o'clock on a Saturday, or I don't know, like, because they obviously play on Saturdays and they're the winter league, we're the summer league and we play on Fridays, you know. You would I don't think they'd be easy enough things to sort out. I mean, I think the summer league has benefited us, so there's no doubt about that. I think it does benefit you in terms of a European run, etc., but does it, benefit, does it benefit the crowds? Know. A lot of people go away. Like you can't really gauge it off anything. Uh, the GAA season in full flow usually as well in the summer. Uh, the GAA season does playing Friday night benefit over playing Saturday yeah. afternoon at three o'clock. I don't know either. Like in England, every game is three o'clock on a Saturday. Every fan loves it. Do you know what I mean? Because they're in Regardless the pub. Regardless of the league as well. Yeah. yeah, they're in the pub at twelve. They make a day out of it, especially for the home games. Or if you're a proper diehard of that club, you know, you might be supporting, let's say you support, I don't know, Doncaster or Rotherham and your team's playing in London. You're getting the train down in the morning, loads of crack on the train, few cans, you get to the game, you know, you're going into the local pub, but that's for away supporters, sing song, you get into the ground. Just think it creates a bit more of an atmosphere where... We're here Friday night. You've got a tri- so Rovers are playing Cork or Dundalk are playing Cork. Or pa- people are finishing work at like four o'clock or three o'clock, having to get on a bus to get the Cork. I don't know. Does it really work? Yeah. There's a, there's a hundred. There's a hundred of them where on a Saturday, you know, would there be more down there? Would they go down on Saturday morning and stay Saturday night? I, I don't know. I just think maybe there's different ways of looking at it and trying to develop in terms of you know could we run especially with covid now could we run like a little bit further into the winter to see how it got on 
don't know. Yeah, because actually the no. preseason is long enough anyway, as it is in the league. Yeah. For some reason, it's very long as well. But you're on about the Friday night thing. It's fine for home fans, as you say, generally, but for away fans, you're coming from Finn Harps up in Donegal, oh. you're travelling to Dublin or Cork, and they do. But, I mean, it's tough. It is tough. Even for the most diehard, that has to be tough. They're bringing a bus load at max, aren't they? 20, 25, like, you know. It's very, it's very tough. You look at Derry, who are probably a really well-supported club. They are, yeah. How many would they get going to Rovers? A hundred? I don't know. Like, I'm just trying to figure out. Like, ish, ish, yeah, ish, roughly, yeah. On a Friday night, yeah. On a Saturday afternoon, on a Saturday afternoon, how many would you get? Maybe you'd still only get a hundred, but you might get more. I don't know. I'd like to think you would get more personally from when you from what from looking at it you would like to think they would get more in fairness like you know yeah it's just it's difficult to know like i just find i just think like there might be a different we might have an opportunity now with what try happened to, to, to try stuff could someone try and play on a saturday at three o'clock but that's yeah that's the point you're making though if we tried more stuff and it didn't work out you can say oh well they tried but we there tried. seems to be a lack of Anyone give yeah. a you know yeah, we've got no we've got no like we've got no like vision, you know. Oh no, we're for all you know. Oh no, it's a ten team Premier League or it's a twelve team, you know. It's no we play each other four times. Like you'd be sick of watching some of the games like Absolutely. that. Four times. You know? yeah. Like is, is there a way like could I watch constantly watch Rovers beat U C D four times a year? Like I know after the third time that they're gonna beat them the fourth time, you know. Without being bad, but that's just that's just how it is. So I just think could we like if we had one developed league between the north and the south combined, maybe there is a vision for it. Maybe people are trying to do it at the minute. And if they are now, we don't know that it's hard for us to tell, but we can only go on what we've seen in the past and yeah. there hasn't been a vision. It's been stale. It's been the same. I mean, if I'm trying to pitch to somebody to try and go to their local to go and see Draw the United or Shelburne or whatever, like I'm going to struggle to come up with a good pitch why they should bother. Yeah, totally agree. Right. Like someone outside of it, if you're diehard draw to whatever, I don't have to yeah. pitch to them, that's the point. But somebody yeah. else, like it's it's very difficult, and I've tried, you know, and it's a very difficult thing to do. Um, yeah. You know, it's a difficult thing to do. There's, there's, yeah. no vi- there's no product as such. Even to try and get your mate to go, you know, you might be going to a game and or even sometimes, like you say to your brother or whatever, do you fancy going up to Rovers? Like, ah, you know, ah, they're only playing Finn Harps, they're going to batter them. Like, and by the, the way, point. Rovers would be one of the easier ones to pitch because of the size of the club and the stadium yeah. the st- and yeah. the buildings and all. But if you were to bring it to, fit, you know, you're going to be good football. Like, mm. so yeah. it's, um, it's difficult, it's difficult. Where I just think if they were. Maybe playing like an northern team or whatever, you know, on a Saturday afternoon, you know, you could make a day of it, like, you know, have a few points, continue on then, whether you want to get the bus into town or the Lewis into town, like, or whatever, like, there's loads of different ways, even in terms of supporters, coaches for away games, they'd probably be better crack on a Saturday morning on Saturday afternoon, you know, rather than Friday evening after work, you're a bit like, that you get down there, you're like lively, and then on the way home, you're getting home at like 3 a.m. Yeah, like, exactly, I was about to say that I was talking to some fans being home at that time, and fair play to them, by the way. But that's not going to be for everybody coming home at 2 a.m., 3 a.m. in the morning, unless you're out on a few beers in a nightclub, maybe. <laughs> yeah. you're, only getting, you're only getting kind of like younger ones with probably a bit of energy and stuff, you know what I mean? And getting home at 2 and 3 a.m., then. If you've had a few cans, like you've kind of got to get a lift or a taxi, so it's costing you again. I don't know, like this. Yeah, you're 16, you can get up in the morning. It's a really good, really good topic um, <laughs> to bring up. Like you could talk about it all night, like, but oh, yeah. where, does, where does, I don't know, it'd be interesting to know what other people think, or maybe like chairman of clubs, or mm. I don't know, the chairman of the league, or even like how, what, what vision does Niall Quinn have for? For the league, or I think what's what? happened to Niall Quinn at the moment, what's been very unfortunate for him is the fact that obviously the Delaney era was, you know, he's taken it over since the Delaney era, and then COVID 19 comes along. And for him, it must be he might have the best intentions ever, but it could be you or me, you know what I mean? 
and you must think, give me a break here. <laughs> what am I supposed uh-huh. to? He's really landed in it. Put it that yeah, way. Kind of catch a break, like in terms of that. Yeah. <laughs> so we but, don't know. Like I feel, I feel they probably think, has good yeah. intentions personally. I think, I think so as well. I think when I've listened to him speak, he's really enthusiastic. And listen, let's be honest about it. He's brought Sunderland from the Championship to the Premier League as a chairman. So yeah, in terms of finances left. You know, in terms of his vision and the way he sees things, he's successful. So let's hope and pray that he can be successful for the league, for the national team, for for the whole organisation in terms of developing it across skills, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, um, yeah, we'll watch this space with um, them. Here, I better get on to you about Leighton Orient because obviously you had a great time at Leighton Orient the fairness. I think you had, what, four years, five years in your first spell? Yeah, yeah I think in total I had six years. Um, just great club, as I said, like about some of the clubs I was at, some fantastic people. Um, and yeah, a place that I hold, obviously very fond um, in my heart. Um, I had I had probably the best time I had in England there, and I can't speak highly enough of the place. Like it was, it was super. Did you you played with Kevin Lisby, and you had a great partnership with him for a lot of the time? Yeah, did you? I did, I did. Yeah, I love Kev. He's a great guy. We still speak now, very close. Um, super, super player Kev was. He was at the end of his career, so I can only imagine how good he must have been as a as a younger lad. Um, but in terms of front man and trying to learn the game off somebody that's one person who I would encourage people just the way he held the ball up was phenomenal and his movement and stuff he was he was class he was a proper number nine like so for me playing in the 10 it was great to um to play off him and stuff but we had we had a great team um at Orient at the time like to get to Wembley and you know when you look at the team to beat was that year um in terms of promotion, we finished third um, with a points tally that would have won the league probably nine out of ten years. You know, it was Wolves and Brentford. And Brentford are fourth in the championship now, and Wolves are like, what, having an unbelievable time in the Premier League. Wolves so. probably shouldn't have been there in the first place. So, you know, no, exactly. So, um, it was, it was, we had a great year that year, and I just think maybe we ran out of steam in the second half in Wembley with everything that we'd gone through. But, um, yeah, it's, it's an amazing place. Like, even like Ada, the kit man, Lindsay, the secretary, like, I still speak to these people, do you know what I mean? So, you know, friends for life and a, a club that I hold very dear in my heart. Did you think that suited your football better, actually, in general, playing with uh, another front man? Yeah, I always enjoyed playing with another frontman, um, Jesse Baker. Don't do that, don't they not, Ranny Moore? Which is a minus detriment. It's a detriment to strikers, isn't it? Now the fact that most clubs only play one player up front, and it's a little disappointing because I mean Quinn and Phillips of Sunderland in the past, like partnerships like that. I love partnerships, so that's something you obviously enjoy, does it? I loved it. Yeah, I look up like how lucky I was at times, like. When I played in Ireland, I played with Desi Baker. Do you know what I mean? Phenomenal player. At Cork, John O'Flynn or Dennis Bean. Do you know what I mean? At, at, um, at Rovers, Trevor Malloy. Do you know, like players like this, where you always played in the two. Then you go to England, a lot of teams are one up front with like... Now, don't get me wrong, one up front can work really well and you can play it really well. But you need to have like really intelligent midfielders and you need to have absolute rocket ships on the wing. So I think one thing that Rovers have done, and Rovers I can always relate to because I, I obviously watch them, they play the three at the back and the two wing-backs. And the two wing-backs have bundles of energy and they're up and down. But because they play the box in midfield, Graham Bourke kind of plays as a number 10 and, and Jack obviously plays everywhere. So when it goes up to whether it be Gaffney or Green or whoever's up front at the time, they've always got somewhere to pass it to. Where you watch some teams who play one up front. So say you might watch Finn Harps who might play one up front. Yeah. When it comes to the frontman, he's got absolutely no one near him. And you're absolutely hanging a fella out to dry like. Mm. You know, so and you wonder why he's not scoring goals. <laughs> yeah. And I'm holding the ball up because you can only hold the ball up for so long before someone's <laughs> gonna get a nick on you. Yeah. So I think like 
one thing that I would do is like kind of study the players that we have, try and create a system around the players that we have and not create a system of like what you think you should be playing. Do you know what I mean? So some people have this idea of playing 4 3 3, yeah? But, but like you might have the players to fit a 4 3 3. So how are you going to fit a 4 3 3 into players where you've got no energy in midfield? It's impossible. You know? So you've got to adapt your coaching mentality in terms of. Do you think there's a lot of coaches like that who have a, like a religious uh, philosophy? 100%. So 100%. No what they have, they, yeah. that's their system and that's it. That's and that's, so unless they get in five or six players to suit their system, whatever. Yeah, you know, they're, they're going to yeah. yeah. You know, I think like if you look at what Stevens done, some weeks he might play four, some weeks he might play three. Like Joey O'Brien can play right back or yeah. he can play right at the centre back. Then you've got Lee Grace on the ball, you've got Pico Lopez. They've got like great players, you know. Liam Scales is another one there now. Yeah, too. Liam who's come in as well. So you've got players where he can play a system to cater to the players that he has, where some managers are just playing a system to cater to themselves and kind of putting, you know, square pegs and round holes, so to speak. So that's one thing that I've learned, especially from England, is trying to adapt your philosophy as a coach or a manager to what you have rather than trying to adapt the players to your philosophy because some of them just mightn't be good enough. It's funny because um, a lot of the modern managers now do do that, don't they? They actually change system from time to time. But you find mm. they have players that kind of don't just suit one role either, which is a great thing. Yeah. It means you can, yeah. you know, week after week, maybe change a few bits. Change a little bit, yeah. little adaption here and there. And that's what you need. You need to, and also you need to adapt to who you're playing. So if, oh, yeah. you know, one team is like maybe going to sit in you know that you can get up and proper get at them up high where you know if you're playing against the long ball team you might have, who has a quick fella up front say like you're playing against the likes of Leicester but then what Leicester have done fairly intelligently is if they brought in little little magicians who play in in behind Vardy so if you drop off and try try to negate the space for Vardy suddenly Madison's in oceans and he's going to cause murder you know so that's, that's what, what you're trying to do. You're trying to confuse the opposition and yeah. people. You know, give them one threat to create another one for yourself. Then, if they try and stop that, then we can go long again or whatever way you want to work it. So, I just think the top managers, you know, when you watch them, whether it be like Pochettino when he was at Tottenham or, you know, Klopp now, Guardiola, they adapt all the time to different games and. Obviously, they're the game elite, elite. Away from elite, the likes of Jose Mourinho, can't you? Though? It's just yeah. a religious thing. Even, like even the fella at Leeds, like you watch Leeds play some recent, unbelievable, like you know, great football. But he's he adapts his team to cater to the players because he's a very intelligent man, and I just think it makes even Lampard. You watch Lampard now, and all right, he's he's adamant on a system. But now, because they have the money, he's buying players to suit that system. So, Werner from Leipzig, when he, or uh, yeah, when they w- would have watched him play, he knows where he plays. He plays in a tree up front at the minute. So, he knows when he comes into Chelsea, he's going to be capable to play in the tree up front, anywhere along the tree. So, he's just add. Yeah. So, I he's know. just. Yeah. He's just oh, like. <laughs> Yeah, so he's adding everything to suit the system that he wants to play, but he's bringing in players that suit the system rather than bringing in a player for the sake of bringing in a player. Like, I think that's what happens though sometimes when the manager doesn't get to choose the players. That can be yeah. a huge thing as well. Like, and You're talking, quickly talking about Chelsea there. I think for some reason Lampard is getting to choose the players is certainly having a major influence, Thank whereas you. other managers may not have been. Like, you know, in other times... What's that? Some fella just turned up on a Monday and you're like, how's it going? <laughs> yeah, I mean, how do you fit in? I remember yeah. Conte when he was manager at Chelsea, he got Ross Barkley and he, you could see him in the press conference, he just wasn't impressed because he wasn't what the type of player that he wanted yeah. at the club. Yeah. And what does a manager do there? Like, you know, it's very difficult to have as well, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, so just I always find that like you can always learn no matter what, even if you're just like a football fan, when you watch. Like when you watch the top managers or the top teams, 
just like just a little bit even the tactical stuff they do on a game like you know it's it's unbelievable the way Firmino plays for Liverpool like that's unheard of like unseen before like a number nine who drops like in deep so the two wingers the two wingers basically play as a two up front and they they Liverpool and Liverpool play a diamond in midfield, but it's it looks like a four three three, but it's not like so. Yeah, it's just different bits. He obviously Klopp adapts his system to suit Mane and Salah because he knows they're going to score loads of goals. And it's very hard to stop. <laughs> yeah, very hard to stop because they're good. They're good with their back to goal because they can roll it and they're strong and they're quick, and then they're good over the top because they're quick and they can finish. So it's very hard to stop when you've got like every trick in the book. Absolutely. Now, Dave, a few questions for you now. Who's the best player you've ever played with? Oh, best player I've ever played with. Um, in terms of like what what benefited me, I'd say Kevin Lisby. Yeah, yeah. In terms of like probably ability and yeah. technique and stuff, probably Gilfie Sigurdsson and our John Josh Elvey. Oh, you played with both those players, yeah? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, best player you come up against? Um, we'll say central defender and we'll say yeah. ability-wise, if you understand. Central, right. central defender, I'd say yeah. Jose Fonte. Fonte, yeah, international Portuguese, yeah. He was just an animal, man. I couldn't get near him. He was too good. Um, and then, I don't know, the other one's a tough one, really, because obviously at different points, like different players stand out. I'm trying to think who always done well against us um, over the years. I don't know, like maybe... I can't really think of anybody else, like in terms of like who... Like obviously you've played against, I've played against some good players, whether it be in an FA Cup game or something, but it's hard... You know, you don't want to judge someone off a of one game. Did, like, play, like, did you play any Premiership sides? The any Premiership sides? Yeah, we, played, we played a good few Premier League sides. Like even even the Southampton team, like that Jose Font was like they had they had Oxley Chamberlain, Lalana, like the Liverpool team. <laughs> Ricky Lambert, like they were all phenomenal. You know, probably Oxley Chamberlain was he was I think seventeen at the time, and we played him at Colchester. They beat us two 0 and he scored two. Like he was unreal. I'll give it to him. I should give it to him. Best manager uh, you've that's managed you essentially. I'd say Russell Slade or Alan Matthews. Got to really? got to give the two of them a bit of kudos there, yeah. And to give it to the two of them. Um, top three goals you've scored in your career. Um, Is that hard? <laughs> yeah, hard enough. I enjoyed. I enjoyed obviously my first one um, for Rovers against Dublin City because it was my first like career goal. Um and then I would got you re- do you remember that very well now as well like I remember Stephen Grant I think setting me up and me just tapping it in from probably a couple of yards but you know it's just to get off the mark you always want to get off the mark so um that would be a highlight and then I scored once against Swindon away um where they kind of scored got one nil up we kicked off and I kind of chipped the keeper from like about 20 yards where the ball was bouncing and he kind of just watched it go over his head. So that was another one because I did like a chip when I was, when I was how, growing. How many, how many times have you watched that back? <laughs> ah, a couple. And then I got one I got one at Cork as well that I really enjoyed against Sligo Rovers at um, Turner's Cross. So I'll go with them three. You'll go with them three. Grand. So, um, yeah, you have plenty of goal compilations as well. Um, David Rissman told me he watches them every day, so I don't know if that's a thing that you do or what. But <laughs> no, I haven't watched them in a while. But sometimes the kids, the kids, I might get the kids to stick it on every now and again. <laughs> no, it is. And all honesty, though, it's great to have that kind of thing as well, though, isn't yeah. it? Like you look back in your career or whatever, and you have proud moments in your career, and you play yeah. for a lot of good clubs and that, and. Um, you know, before I go, actually, I better mention the Irish under twenty threes. You played for them, didn't you? Twice. What was it like to represent your country? Really good, yeah. I really, really enjoyed it. Um, Pat Fenlon was the manager when we were there, and obviously Seamus Coleman played in that team, and you know some really good players. Stephen Rice, who's doing great with his coaching and stuff now. So there was some really good players. Gerald O'Brien was in that squad. 
I want to think Gavin Pearce, Dennis Bean. Like, we've got some really, really, really good players. John Paul Kelly, who was at Bowles at the time. I don't know if you remember him. He was an excellent player. Um, Killian Brennan. So, like, all the top kind of young lads played in that team. And it was, uh, we had great crack out in the Port Marnock Hotel. And I think we won the two games. We beat Northern Ireland and we beat someone else. And Trapatoni came to watch us. And, you know, all that stuff. So it was great. Like, it was really good. And to represent Ireland, like, we still have the jersey and stuff. So, um, yeah, it was good. But it's one thing that you always want to do. And no matter at what age or what level, it was, it was very, um, you know, very nice feeling and very good for the family to, to see me play for Ireland and stand there and sing the anthem in front of uh, Pack Daily Mount Park. Yeah, fantastic. Look, Dave, it's been great chatting to you. Thanks very much for coming on. No really enjoyed us. I uh, really appreciate it. All right, thanks, thanks very much. Very much mate. Good luck, but thanks yeah. very much. Not about it.